How's everyone doing? Great to have you here, and great to be with Avinash from Arrival. Uh, it's a time of heightened interest in the electric vehicle space, uh, so I think our conversation is very timely. And to start, I just wanted to give you the opportunity, Avinash, um, to speak a little bit about what makes Arrival different from some of the other companies that we're all reading about. Yeah, so I think uh, in the mobility space, it's undergoing a rapid transition to electric and sustainable technologies. And we were founded 2015, um, got over 2,500 employees uh, all around the world. And we essentially looked at the transition that was occurring and how quickly, even from an environmental standpoint, from an um, equality standpoint, how quickly we needed to move to this um, green, green transportation. But to do that using the system that got us there in the first place with the issues we see today, we fundamentally thought um, is not the right way to continue forward. So we were able to uh, spend the, the last six odd years redesigning how vehicles are designed, engineered, and produced. So we are vertically integrated. We do the software, the components, like the battery management system, et cetera, in-house. We've uh, removed the need for metal uh, bodies. We use um, a composite recyclable material for that that's lighter, more durable than steel. And then we uh, pioneered a totally new production method where we're producing our vehicles in what we call micro factories, which are about 20,000 square meter uh, warehouses that we can convert to production facilities in about six to 12 months, depending if the building exists. And we're able to deploy those locally in cities. So you can think of micro factories being able to be placed anywhere in the world. So we've got uh, one in the UK, one we've announced in Madrid, and two in, uh, in South, Car South and North Carolina in the US. They're placed near cities, they produce vehicles locally, they're employed by local people, paying local taxes, and then the vehicles you produce are used in the local uh, mobility ecosystem. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, the innovation of micro factories, it's really interesting. Um, and you previously worked at one of the large automakers when you were at Cruise. What was the decision process like you know, to break away from the old tradition of the, the massive assembly plants? So we were talking backstage, you know, imagine kind of a supermarket sized factory producing cars. What was that decision like and was it difficult kind of throwing off such a long established tradition? Yeah, it's, it's super difficult. And I think um, uh, one of the most important things, especially for the, for the founders in the audience, is you know, we, we had that vision um, and we stuck with it. You know, we, we have had to engineer layers and layers of deep technologies to accomplish the ability to produce vehicles. We had to totally rewrite the rules. Uh, but it comes from what problem are we trying to solve? So obviously we want to make cities have clean air. And on a business side, we had an economies of scale problem in the industry. So if you travel the world right now, it doesn't matter where you go, you see the same vehicles everywhere. And that's because the current, the, or I should say the traditional method, you have to produce hundreds of thousands of vehicles for the business to make sense. So we took a look at that business model and said, well, why would we continue down that path? If you could produce vehicles locally and you could do it at a much lower capex and a much lower um, uh, vehicle cost, then you could do it everywhere. But to stick to that, you know, we were, we were self-funded for the first um, you know, three or four years of our existence. Um, and then we took on our first um, VC, well, actually it was a strategic investor that invested in us. So I think you know, a key message here is that um, as founders, really being able to stick to the, to stick to the mission uh, you'll have a lot of distractions along the way, but really being able to understand it. You know, we say, <laughs> we say we, we're going from A to B, but we might go via C, D, E, and F to get there, right? But we're still going there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what, yeah, what have been some of the learnings you've had along the way? Um, and maybe to get into a little more detail, too, about like, exactly what benefits you're getting from the micro factories. Yeah, so the micro factory, first of all, they're about targeted to be 50 million uh, US dollars to deploy. So we can work directly with the city. Uh, we, we are building buses, vans, and cars uh, out of a micro factory. So our bus will be in trial with First Bus uh, in the UK early next year. Our van, we're partnered with UPS and others. And our car, we're actually designing alongside Uber. 
So, you know, we've, we've built strong partnerships based on the fact that we can produce any of these uh, vehicle types in our micro factory. So the benefit we get is, you know, lower upfront capital, uh, faster rate of return. We can work directly with the city to create vehicles that match the city's needs. Uh, sustainability is obviously critical, so micro factory, lower energy footprint, um, low water usage, uh, we don't use a paint shop or metal stamping plant, so uh, none of the tricky environmental hurdles that you have to go through, none of that exists when you fundamentally redesign how you produce vehicles. And the other benefit is um, it uplifts local communities. So we've done a study with the city of Charlotte where we add about 150 odd million per year uh, to their GDP. So when you're, when you're hiring local folks to produce the local buses or vans and cars that the city will use, you've obviously got a really nice um, uh, circle of reciprocity there. And, and what have been um, some of the lessons you've taken along the way? You know, if, if for anyone else who's thinking about uh, physical manufacturing and the possibility of smaller factories, you help them uh, skip a step. Yeah, I think, like I said, we had to, we, we had to design a lot of technologies that uh, didn't exist before. And we pulled a lot from different industries as well. So, you know, if anyone's out there really looking at, at transforming an industry, whether it's healthcare or, or food and beverage or farm tech or whatever, and really pulling across different industries and finding innovations. So, for example, um, you know, we have to design a whole new level of robotics in our, in our uh, micro factories. So we've got um, folks from NASA, actually, that work for us and are looking at doing that. Uh, when it comes to the composite material, so instead of uh, steel for our bodies, we use a, a polypropylene glass fiber, it's a composite, but it actually pulls from the textile industry. So uh, if you come to one of those factories, you'll see the material being weaved like you would weave a shirt. And then we use our process to turn it into a panel that's more durable than steel. But a lot of the technology is coming from innovations found in other industries brought together to really disrupt the automotive industry. So I think you have two micro factories currently deployed, um, one in the US, one in the UK, so very nicely geographically split. Um, but how do you think about the regional opportunities and, and when you're strategizing for the next you know, dozens of micro factories that you're planning, where you'll place them? Yeah, so I fundamentally believe that if, w if we're gonna solve the climate crisis, everybody needs to go electric. There's no point, you know, UK, Europe, US, all shifted into being electric and then the rest of the world basically lags behind. And if you think about, you know, how this actually works, right? So um, a lot of the, the times when you're traveling to developing nations, you're actually seeing secondhand vehicles that are coming from more wealthy nations that have been sort of used to a point of depreciation that then the, the other nations purchase. If we're all going to clean up the world, then vehicles, electric vehicles need to be affordable for everybody. So one of the first things that, the reason we design these technologies in this way is so that we can make the price point competitive with the fossil fuel equivalent that it's taking on, you know, whether it's our bus, our van, our car, and beyond. So once you've done that, you're able to bring everybody alongside. But then you have to really look at, well, what does that mean for the business case? So we've doing some pioneering things in a vehicle, like the vehicle is upgradable in hardware and software. So that means if you're upgrading the hardware as well, you're increasing its residual value of the vehicle at its end of its life. So the delta between the initial purchase costs and what you can do with it later, because you're refreshing it all the time from hardware and software, um, the economics change. So now you can look at the business model and say, well, even if you might not necessarily be able to do the initial capital purchase, we can create a business model that allows you to access an electric vehicle, and then at the end of life, we can refresh that vehicle. So, you know, these innovations transform not just the initial product, but the whole business model around it. And so when we think about deploying microfactories, we think about putting them everywhere. I think every city around the world, uh, so our, our microfactory brand builds 10,000 vans a year, as an example. Every major city in the world can support you know, 10,000 uh, vans a year and more. And so we can literally just work with the local city um, and say, we can bring a micro factory uh, to your neighborhood. And because it's only six to 12 months and it's green tech, you know, we can get going really quickly. So we've announced, we've actually announced four, uh, three of them come online uh, next year. 
but the opportunities for microfactories, you know, they're really endless. I mean, we want, we want to have this local production facility everywhere. It'd be great, you know, if Helsinki had one and the, the, the buses and the vans that are used here and the cars are being produced locally. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, I think it's a classic kind of question about the electric vehicle space, but in terms of the timelines that you're, you're looking at, because um, you have interesting opportunities with public transportation, uh, with, with shipping and delivery. How soon are we talking about that um, you know, public transportation fleets could be you know, adopting arrival en masse? I, I would say a lot quicker. Like with any disruptive tech, um, it normally takes longer for it, the transitions to start. It doesn't matter what it is. You know? I mean, I'm seeing a lot of amazing in innovation in healthcare, for example, right? It takes a long time to start, but once it starts, it transitions really quickly. And I think in the uh, automotive industry, we've actually seen that already. There is not one city that we talk to that doesn't want an electric uh, public transportation system, for example. There's not one customer, large fleet owner that we talk to, and small fleet owners that don't want to shift to an electric vehicle. So um, I think that we are ultimately now already limited by capacity rather than demand. You know? So uh, mentioned UPS have ordered 10,000 vehicles from us with the option for 10,000 more. Um, that's just one example. You know? We're seeing that everywhere. What do you want from governments that you're not already getting? I think it's important that we don't build, whatever industry we're in, we don't build an industry that relies on subsidies and incentives. Right? So, because you, that can essentially be a crutch to um, a barrier to entry for a lot of startups coming in as well, because now you know the big players are able to sort of offset their costs um, through government incentives. I think it's important um, that, especially startups, we create a, a business that allows us to compete with the bigger players uh, through either cost experience or you know um, whatever our unique proposition needs to be. For Arrival, one of the key was that we need to produce an electric vehicle that's at a competitive price point with diesel, but we need to bring better product attributes. So we need better payload, we need better cargo volume efficiency, you know, better range, whatever that is, and we need these technologies to be sustainable. That way, when a purchase manager is making a decision for a commercial vehicle to purchase with a rival, they're making the right decision for their business, the planet, and the people. And the subsidies can aid that and make it even more attractive, but that's not the reason. The subsidy is not the reason for the purchase. And so, you know, we're, we are driving towards that point where it's just a better product at a better price and it's green. So why wouldn't you? And once that has happened, then I think the, the possibilities there are endless. So, uh, so you recently uh, de-spacked, um, I think it was March. Yep. And, uh, and there's a bit of a hiccup, I guess, um, in early November. Uh, you, know, you said that production next year was going to be a little slower than expected. And so I guess I was just curious to ask um, kind of what changed in the calculus? You know, what, what kind of was the surprise there? Yeah, I think um, what we're doing is hard. Uh, when you're reinventing a, a whole industry, it's hard. But I think what's important is Production hasn't changed. The start of production hasn't changed. Our vehicles, are, uh, we're on road uh, in many of the vehicles already, like we have vans in Dubai uh, at the expo with UPS now. We have first bus early next year. Public road trials begin. We start production for our bus in Q2. We start production for our van in Q3. What has changed is simply the ramp. Um, I think when we initially thought about that ramp 12 months ago, uh, we th it was more aggressive. And as we're going through it, which is you know, normal for any company as they're, as they're starting to uh, get closer to their start of production or, or product launch, um, as we looked at it, we thought, well, let's take a bit longer to ramp capacity. So start production, take a bit longer to ramp capacity, make sure it's really ironed out because then the blueprint is there. And then when we push scale, you know, we can just start deploying all these microfactories um, rapidly. So you know, for the founders out there, I mean, um, and even the VCs, that, that patience is really important because if you're going to disrupt something, things will change. And what you, you think you're going to do as you start doing it, it will change. Uh, and that's okay. And I think um, um, it's just a regular part of, I think, launch. But I think the key thing is technology is developed, startup production is uh, where we ex expect it to be, and then we're just going to ramp it up a little bit more pragmatically before we really you know, push go on scaling.
and, and maybe that speaks as well to you know, some of the differences between hardware and software. And I know yeah. you do both, but you can update an app, but updating uh, a door is a little more uh, complicated once it's off the assembly line. Uh, hardware's tough. There's, there's no doubt hardware's tough. But you know, there's a lot of impact, I think, when you can combine the two. Um, we're seeing this in, in, in many different fields. You know? um, you know, gaming's a really interesting one where they sell the, the hardware at a loss and make it up on the software and so on. So I think there is you know, quite a bit of um, um, opportunity there. But I think um, we were talking about this backstage. What's interesting is we've, we started with being self-funded and then we got a private strategic investment. And then we went public through a SPAC um, early in March. We're actually UK's largest tech IPO um, ever which was very humbling. And we recently completed a um, capital raise in the public markets. And if I can, if I can just share my insights on that, you know, when, we, when you're private and you're doing the investment round, the investors are really getting a lot of time to get to know you and going really deep in your business model. So if you're at that stage of your business, from my experience, it's really important to be very clear what do the next 12, 24, 36, 48 months look like. Obviously, as you get further out, it's going to be less defined, but really being clear on you know, what's your go-to-market strategy and then how do you expand your business. And the investors are going to look at that and they get to really pull the lid off and really get to know your team. Because at the end of the day, investors are going to invest in your team. I was on the other side of the world. Um, um, you know, at, at General Motors, we were looking at a range of startups. I've done other startups myself. And... Um, you know, we would always look at the team. Um, so the team is going to be critically important, but also really being clear on how do you get there. When you're on the public side, though, it's really about what are you doing like right now, today. And the investors get, I would say, less time. You, there's a lot of forward-looking statements that you just cannot make, right? Legally, the structure is not like that. So you're, you're really focusing on, okay, what are you achieving now? And the other big difference is that in private, um, you're really balancing the investment quantum and your valuation. But those two things are, are going to be moving around as you go through the deal. And really understanding your valuation, I think, is, is important in how you justify the valuation, whether it's through comparisons with other startups or a, a appropriate um, percentage of the TAM, being very clear on valuation and understanding how willing you are to move on it is, is very important in, when you're private. When you're public, the valuation's set, you know? So that side of the deal um, is easier. You know, people either want to come in at a certain share price or they don't. Um, so, you know, when you really look at it, private, you have, take the opportunity to get to know the VCs, especially the ones, your investors, if, if, you, if you have them already, really let them understand what you're doing and how you're going about it. Um, because that's the easier part. The more difficult part is the negotiation on what your valuation is going to be. The flip side, when you're public, you're going to get less time to really talk about where you are going to go in a very direct, distinct, clear way. You have to be a little more careful there and focus more on today. But the actual raising part is relatively straightforward because you know, those parts are done for you. Yeah, so Arrival, um, you know, along with the recent uh, equity fundraising that you did on the public markets, there was also a green bond mm -hmm. issuance, uh, roughly $300 million. I think a lot has been made about investor interest in sustainability. And so I was curious just to hear about that process, you know, how it differed from a, a traditional bond offering. Um, did it, you know, whet your appetite for more? Yeah, I think, so we, we in total, we raised another $640 million. Um, I would say for an automotive company, uh, the capital that we've raised, we're extremely efficient. You know, we've invested about 900 million to date. We've raised uh, another 600 odd through the SPAC. Um, we've got some obviously cash on hand too. So what was interesting was demand far exceeded um, what we had set our uh, raise at. And we, we basically um, maximized it to the, to the most we could. Um, the demand was significantly uh, higher even than what the, the 640 that we raised. And what's interesting about it is on the green side, um, you know, it's essentially almost split half and half between common equity and, and the converts. The green investment is real, like the money is coming in. But I think it's really important to separate 
how those proceeds are being used. Uh, is your company really focused on ESG, or are you just trying to you know, sort of do something so you can get access to that capital? And I think, you know, even the the, the VC and the and the and the large um, um, investment funds are still trying to figure that part out. But the the money is is rolling in, and the investment, the appetite is there. I believe that every company should have ESG baked in to what they do. Not as a strategy, it's, it's, a, it's part of what you are. It has to be part of your products. So for us, you know, making sure that we recycle the batteries. But you know, in, our, in our industry, it's kind of like this sort of um, dirty secret that everyone focuses from the cell forward, because that's the nice part. You can talk a lot about all of the green technologies and everything we're doing. But there's a whole stuff that happens before you get the actual battery cell that not enough people are talking about. And going out and attacking those problems as a, a real part of your company. Um, so it has to be real. Make it part of it. It's, it's not just about you know, being good for um, your business, but obviously for the planet. I mean, we're at a stage where companies are they're not just profit generating machines, they're also meant to serve the community. So if you have a strong ESG focus in your business, whatever it is, um, you will be able to, to find investment around that, definitely. And yeah, do you feel like it, it opened up opportunities for you that you wouldn't have had otherwise? Yeah, yeah I think ultimately it was, so we were, we were green by nature in terms of what we're doing, you know, electric vehicles, local production, um, um, uplifting local communities, affordable vehicles. So I wouldn't necessarily say it opened up new, new opportunities. We we're already having conversations with the governments and, and um, our operators around the world. But I would say that you can see that the accelerator pedal's been pushed down, <laughs> no pun intended. But the point is that now the investment's coming in. So now it's up to the companies to actually go and do something, right? And I think that is really what's evolving now. It's this sort of, okay, we're, we're getting in there, let's go. And um, so I think it, it just sort of reinforced that this transition, at least in, in community, the minds of people, it's already happened. And now there's like, the, we, we've got to make sure that the lag for when the, when the innovations come isn't too great, because then the patience will run out. So we've got to be really moving forward. And I think, um, uh, I think we're just going to see a lot more um, investment in this space. Yeah. Um, and the automotive industry, notoriously complex, notoriously expensive. Will you have to come back for more financing sometime soon? I mean, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll look at that based on where we are as a business. I mean, we obviously want to scale really rapidly. So right now our focus is on we've got the uh, start of production for, for the products next year. Um, as we get the micro factories ramped up, I mean, the sky's the limit. I mean, we can literally deploy them in warehouses. Doesn't need any special building. We can put them anywhere in the world. And so when we scale, it's always going to be a balance between how fast do we want to scale uh, versus how much capital we, want, we need. And, and you know, we'll make that call as we go through the coming 12 and 24 months. But uh, make no mistake, I mean, we, we want to scale and we want to scale rapidly. And maybe it's because I'm, I'm a Europe tech reporter, but I am always interested in, in ways in which um, you know, Europe has a kind of a leadership position. Yep. And so I guess I was curious, like, do, you, do you feel like there's any, anything particularly attractive about Europe in terms of you know, government support or you know, the, the labor force when you're, when you're looking at where you want to build and sell your vehicles? Talent, you know, ta- the talent across Europe's amazing. I, I personally don't, um, you know, we've got a headquarter in US, in US headquarter in UK. We're in um, Amsterdam, Spain, Germany. Um, but I don't see us, a, I just see us as a global company. I see the talent pool as just everywhere. Um, if, you're, if you're good at what you do, I encourage you to come and work for a rival, basically. Um, but obviously, governments in Europe, when it comes to the transition to green technologies, I mean, they're, they're forefront, they're leading that discussion. So yeah, absolutely. But I, I don't think that talent is concentrated in any one area that makes it any special than any other area. Investment is, in case of Silicon Valley and some others, but not talent. Very nice. And may, maybe as the last question, um, 
There's a brief moment where Arrival was uh, lighting up a little bit on Reddit, so I was curious, <laughs> curious to ask what uh, it was like being a, you know, a meme stock on the other side. So funny story, we, Arrival, yeah, we were a meme stock. Um, the, Dennis, the, the founder, and, and I actually joined Reddit, and then he got kicked off because no one actually believed it was him. But we were on there, and we, we were trying to engage the community. I think... Um, I, I, I think this is just the norm now. You know, the retail investment through fintech platforms, they're just as engaged and involved in, you, in your company as um, the, large, the large traditional investors. And um, I just, it's, I think it's very important though that it's not just about following a trend because then there's real people that can lose real money. And I think that education piece needs to happen. And that's why we're on there. So if you, if you want to learn about Arrival, we're trying to engage with the community based as much as we can say, obviously, uh, on the topics to help them get a better understanding and, and make a decision. But um, I just think that's you know, another unique thing about us. We'll be out there chatting, chatting to people. You, you might find an interesting photo of me with an orange and a spoon if you check out Reddit. All right, now you know how to find Avanash next time. <laughs> Great, I think our time is up, but thanks everyone. Great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Avanash. Thanks.